Brixton has a rich history with basketball, and as you know, they've, a lot of the young people that have come through all the way to the top, like Lowell Deng, came from Brixton. That's right. What is the difference, in your opinion, because you started way back in the day up to now? What has changed from then till now for you? Well, I, I don't have the privilege of coming back to England as much as I would like um, to even work events like this. Almost all the work that I have is actually in the States, uh, in college and some at the professional level. I wish I had more of an opportunity, so I, I really can't speak with, with too much insight into how basketball looked then versus it where it's at now. All I can comment on is, is where it was then, and I can understand some of the reasons why Brixton has become uh, a hotbed of talent, and it's been consistent year after year after year. And I think a part of it is, is passion, that you have some individuals who have literally given the better part of their lives. And you, know, you look at coaches like junior coaches like Paul Ambrosius, I don't think he coaches as much anymore, but individuals like Jimmy Rogers, who from junior level and senior level has just really given so much of himself to the community. And that type of passion, it's infectious. And, and it causes others to want to get involved in the community and contribute to the community and give individuals a way of, um, of really, at times, expressing uh, frustration and through sport. Um, and also it gives them opportunities just to be involved in something extremely positive. But I think the biggest thing it gives individuals, many individuals at least, is a vision of excellence. That you have some individuals that might be from environments that some might call disadvantaged or marginalised. And the Top Cat system, my humble opinion, has given someone a vision of excellence. When you have a vision of excellence, you have some hope and optimism in your life to say, you know what, I could do something really special in this game. And I know when Jimmy Rogers came across me, I was in a scrimmage situation in Elephant and Castle. And here was this, here was this coach, uh, he, and he says that you've obviously worked really hard in your game. So he started out being very complimentary. So I'm thinking, I like this guy. <laughs> and Jimmy says, but you know what? You could be something really special if you come to Brixton. Um, because there are coaches that are going to take you under their wing and, and put time into you. And the Brixton system was one of the first systems that actually said, as opposed to, because I'm obviously, I'm a, I'm a short guy um, and don't really fit in on most basketball teams in terms of how I look and my stature and so on. But, but Jimmy was the type of individual that he is the, you know, it, it's almost like the uh, Emma Lazarus um, poem that's attached to the Statue of Liberty. You know, bring me your huddled, <laughs> your, 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 your huddled masses and, yeah. and, and, and he'll, he'll do something wonderful with them. And, and that, that was my experience with Brixton. And, with the Brixton system, I genuinely had a sense, you know, I've actually got a shot of going to college one day on a full scholarship. So I couldn't afford to, my family could not have afforded to go to, to, to university. But here I've got an opportunity here to use basketball as a vehicle and go to university. And, and, it, and that happened for me. And I ended up getting a, uh, a full scholarship to go to a, uh, a university um, in Virginia, um, to the States, and have one of my dreams athletically come true. And, and I can attribute a lot of that to the Brixton system, to, to Top Cats basketball. If you guys just tuned in, you are watching The Drop, and I'm joined by Spencer Woods. Man, if you hear his story, you're going to be amazed. And he's right here at the Gold Hawks Super Clinic down here at ACS International School. Now, we talked about your journey from Brixton to America, and now here. I want to know more about what you're doing in America. You have all these skills. We need you back here. But you're over there giving it to them. What are you doing there and why not here? Well, it, it, it's a good question. My the particular role that I took was in the realm of mental skills and toughness training. The common term for an individual like me is a sport psychologist. It's someone that works on things like poise and focus and confidence and big game preparation and how athletes mentally rebound and respond from mistakes. How they can effectively flush and fix and forget a mistake. And in the States, there is a huge market Obviously, with the level of funding in sport in general, they can afford to branch out into many different areas of specialization. So, yes, you've got your skilled trainers and you've got your, your coaches, but you've also got nutritionists and you've got individuals in exercise science and you've got individuals in sports psychology to really take a, a holistic view of an athlete. Because, obviously, there is a very heavy emphasis in sport. It's interwoven into the fabric of society. And not to say that certain sports aren't that way in England. If you look at the history of, say, football, or to a degree, to a lesser degree, but still a, 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 a large degree, uh, cricket and rugby, they are typically well-funded sports. 
and, and other sports don't have as much funding, they don't have as much of an advantage. And so, it, selfishly for me, uh, in terms of what actually um, provides a living, I have to go where there is funding, and that is typically, unfortunately, the United States. But this has presented me with a rare option, a rare opportunity to actually come back to, to home soil, so, so to speak, and actually do what I love, and and hopefully breathe some additional skills into English youth. And, and so it, it's meant an awful lot to me to, to come back. I wish I had the opportunity to do it more often. How have you found it today, though? When you look at the structure and you look at what you're trying to do here for the young people in the UK, what do you think of it? You obviously have to be very impressed with Goldhawks basketball on multiple levels. First off, they, they've managed to uh, negotiate and work and partner with some amazing facilities. We're here at a state-of-the-art facility that when I was growing up playing basketball, and I was having this conversation a little bit earlier on, Perspex backboards, just see-through backboards, something as basic as that. It, you know, that was maybe in a handful of gyms across the country. Um, and you look at a facility like this, this would have been when I played, it would have been one of the best facilities in the country, hands down, um, and certainly the best in London. And from what I hear, and I've not personally experienced this because I've not come back often enough, but from what I hear, there are actually the first few purpose-built uh, facilities in the country. I, I think uh, John Amici had been involved in one in Manchester, and, and obviously with the Olympics, there was the, I think it's called the Copper Box, am yes, I out? the Copper Box. The yeah. Copper Box, so, so a, a lot has changed from a facility standpoint, but still, when you look at basketball relative to some of the other sports, it's still terribly underfunded, which is a shame because what you see, and this goes back to your question about Goldhawks mm -hmm. basketball, what you see is a tremendous emphasis on youth and youth development. And if that's not worth funding, if in terms of the distribution of, of, of funds and, and resources, my gosh, that, obviously, if that's not worth funding, that, not, nothing is. It's interesting you say that because over the years, especially in the last five, six years, the NBA has had a huge emphasis on the NBA global games. You know, obviously, it builds their brand, it promotes their league globally, but in London, every time an NBA team comes to London, the tickets are sold out within an hour. Within an hour, it's sold out. And this is the O2 arena. And I, for, for me, I feel like there needs to be a marriage between what's going here on a grassroots level and what NBA is trying to do globally, especially when they come here to do their games. How do we marry that together? How do we get the NBA to have a look at what we're doing at a grassroots level and support or even try to respect what we're doing, trying to do here with the young people? I would love to see the NBA involved in, in more youth programs mm -hmm. in England. I think that if they see the level of interest at the grassroots level that is rapidly growing, um, I, I think there's opportunities there for, for the league. I mean, the, from David Stern on through to the, the new commission, they've, they've talked openly about wanting to, as you said, you know, grow the global game. Uh, and I think there is a market here, but I think the one thing they question is, that, is the sustainability of it that it's easier to have a sellout arena when you understand the exclusivity that's attached to that particular game. But if something goes from exclusive to normalized, where, okay, this is a once every week occurrence, it becomes a type of situation that instead of like saying, wow, I could see LeBron, I could see Kevin Durant, or I could see a, a Dirk Nowitzki or whomever, they're like, oh, well, you know what, I can catch the next week's game or because there's gonna be another game. And I think that, in the States, you've got, obviously, you've got sustainability. NBA is one of the most successful sports franchises in the world. But I think that the concern is, and it would need to be proved to them, that that type of financial uh, risk is actually not a risk at all, that it has some sustainability, that they're gonna get ongoing support week in, week out, month in, month out. So I think that would assuage some, some concerns. But all of this is conjecture on, on my part because I, I, I work with a couple of NBA teams, but I don't work within the league, the, the league itself to understand their strategic vision and, and how they're looking to implement that and really their, their feelings. So this is just my, my humble two pennies worth or two cents worth, their true feelings on, on where the UK is in terms of their global priorities. But just the fact that they have expressed an interest and just the fact that they're having games in the United Kingdom even if they are sort of exhibition games at times, that's still a, a step in the right direction. So that, that's a positive. Mm -hmm. Doctor, he's a doctor, by the way, Dr. Spencer. If there are any British people out there that want to do what you want to do, what advice would you give them? Well, the, the field is 
in the UK, I think it is a slightly tougher road to travel, quite honestly, uh, for the same reasons that I mentioned when I started, to say that psychology is respected as a profession, but sports psychology, that particular track, for many individuals, they may have to moonlight in sports psychology with their main income might have to be in psychology. And, and, and that's a slightly different track and that has its own challenges. It means that someone has to embrace the, the, the daily tasks of dealing with, with human dysfunction and your general person on the street that may, maybe is dealing with some anxiety or mood disorders and personality disorders or something else that requires um, pharmacological intervention. And you have to deal with that while you're moonlighting as a sports, psychology, uh, sports psychologist because it would be a little bit harder, in my humble opinion, to pay the regular bills in just doing sports psychology. But my personal passion is for sport. I, I love it. You know, I, I see the mind as this ever-expanding uh, array of inner horizons that while we've got some limitations physically, we can make rapid improvements physically, skills, athletic ability, but still there are physical limitations. For example, it would be ludicrous for me to suggest that man can run 100 meters in six seconds. It'd be laughable. You know, at best you see one hundredth of a second or at times with a breakout run, a tenth of a second coming off the world record in the 100 meters, um, which obviously is in the nines right now. So for me to say, you know, it's possible for man to run 100 in, in, in six seconds, most would laugh it off. And largely they'd be right, but when it comes to the mind and the potential of someone to understand a different part of themselves or generate confidence when they're under pressure or develop really smart ways of rebounding from mistakes, there, it's, an, it's a, an array of ever-expanding horizons. It's limitless and, and, and that's what really drives my passion. That, that's what excites me to work with athletes to try and tap into that and, and find that so they can develop those, those skills. I want to be the Oprah of sports. Five years from now, what advice would you give me to build my mental stability to be able to achieve that? Well, my first thing to say would be in regards to basic networking and business acumen, <laughs> it would be this, is that, um, and I'm definitely not pandering to you when I say this, that you've got a really bubbly personality. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very charismatic, you're a very friendly person, which obviously helps in broadcasting. But w the one thing I've seen with, with Oprah, before I get to some of the psychological stuff, is her ability to network initially. I'm not sure if you saw her genesis where she was just, she actually sent in a, a, a tape um, of her, it was basically a, a type of, um, a, of interview, um, a kind of a mock interview where, where she was just introducing herself and, and just try to get a, a TV gig, as they say, just through that tape. And she was absolutely relentless. Um, and the one thing you can say about Oprah is she's got amazing interview skills as you do, <laughs> great personality as you do, but she also had a relentlessness in regards to her career and her business acumen is, is phenomenal. I mean, she's been able to parlay so many things that she's been doing in, in, in broadcasting and, um, into so many different types of businesses, um, which has also increased her, her visibility. So I think it's not it pains me to say this because the best person doesn't always get that type of role where most would think well you know what it's about talent or it's about looks or it's about the overall package and unfortunately that's not true you have to have a very high level of those of, of, of some of those things but you also have to have a level of business acumen and also a resiliency and this may be when it is where it dove, does dovetail into the psychological aspects of, of, of how an individual progresses. We're not even talking about sport. It could be broadcasting, but it could be sport or any other, any other field. Is that an individual has to be able to have, and there's a big movement in, in my particular field in terms of closed and open mindset and fixed mindsets. You have to have an open mindset where you actually see failure as a growth experience for you versus getting bitter by it or, getting, or developing a lack of self-confidence because of that failure. Um, failure almost has to energize you because you've found just another way not to do something which actually brings you closer to your goal versus further from your goal. Where most individuals with a closed mindset see failure as a threat. And that there is an initial fear of failure to prevent them from even doing it in the first place. And that could be seen as, in a sense, a lower zone of discomfort to say, gosh, I, I'd be very, very uncomfortable thinking about that failure. But you have to understand about high achieving individuals too, whether it's athletics or some other field, there's also an upper zone of discomfort, which is not as well known and not nearly as well talked about. And in this upper zone of discomfort, there are individuals who actually fear that success. Now that sounds counterintuitive. Why would you ever fear success? 
Well, most individuals would be terrified by what success would actually do to their life in terms of the level of expectations on them, the level of self-imposed pressure, what that means. Your life changes in dramatic ways. And not every single one of those ways is necessarily a, a positive thing. And individuals on the surface talk about wanting certain success, but there is often an upper zone of success. You see it in sports as well, where to say, you know what, I understand the things that make you uncomfortable when you fail, but what level of success begins to actually make you uncomfortable? You know, for example, as a golfer, if you make the PGA Tour or the European Tour, are you really comfortable seeing yourself in that role? Well, how about competing in a major, your first major, whether it's the British Open um, or the US Open or the PGA Championship? Could you honestly see yourself competing? What about if you get close to winning that thing, really close to your first major championship in golf? And all of a sudden, when you really begin to analyze this, you begin to realize, you know what? I've got some lower zones of discomfort in my life where I've got a fear of failure. But I've also got some upper zones of discomfort too, where there's actually, I'm fearing a little bit of success. Am I ready for this? And, 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 am I ready for this? And that actually can hold me back too, because there is a, a term in my field called self-sabotage. And it's not when things happen to you where you get a bad break or, 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 or someone tells you you're not good enough. Self-sabotage is when you find ways of ensuring that you won't put yourself in that position where you're this close to the success. And it sometimes is, is a result of fear of failure, sometimes a result of fear of success. And that can wreak havoc in the mind just as much uh, as, a, as a fear of failure. So to fully answer your question, I would say it's a confluence of things. It's having the broadcasting package of having that personality and, 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 and being able to ask really good questions and, and, and being somewhat of a, a psychologist as a broadcaster, putting yourself on parity with the person that you are speaking to, right? But it's also a, a, an aspect of business acumen, it's resiliency, and it's also breaking through lower zones of discomfort and upper zones of discomfort, so that you're okay with that success if it comes your way. That's awesome. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> this is crazy. But this is Dr. Spencer Woods. If you want to find out more, please do Google his name and find out by him, because right now I'm feeling a bit, wow. But thank you so much. My pleasure. For the chat. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> no, it's good. You too. I'm going to go and follow you on Twitter now. Okay. <laughs>